Hey everybody, welcome back. So, today, we've got a couple things we're gonna do today. First things we're gonna do is the, uh, the in the mail segment. I got something in the mail this week that's really cool, and uh, I put the shout out about it last week, and here it is, I got one. So, we're gonna do that, um, and we are going to show the C.W. Eldridge Paul Rogers presentation from the Tattoo Historical Society meeting. Um, again, we got so much footage down there and we want to share this history with you guys. Uh, so stay tuned and check this out. What's in the mail? Okay, so what's in the mail this week? There we go. Let's see. I'm going to use my pink scissors this week. And the first one comes from, uh, from Raging Flicks again. Um, love these guys, they're on eBay, they're a great seller. And they always send it really well packaged, whatever it may be. I'm pretty sure I know what this one is. I sent off for this a couple weeks ago. They're usually pretty quick about sending them too. Um, but they do, they do wrap them all up in this, <laughs> this cellophane that I'm not gonna play with. Um, so this is a Big Joe Kaplan supply card now you all know from past uh, uh, past uh, episodes that it's it's definitely harder to get the cards than it is to get the goods now the Joe Kaplan goods you can get every now and then you can get his machines uh, sometimes you can get his jewelry but not very often uh, I don't think he made a ton of it so but we got this we're gonna put this together with the machine that we got at the auction um, and I'll, I'll show both of those in, a, uh, in an episode coming up. Um, it's gonna be a uh, how to put it all together episode again. All right, this one, this one's a mystery. Um, I forgot what I ordered. It came super taped up. Uh, it may take me a second to get into it. And it's from Stargazer Tattoo in Minnesota. Uh, these guys love uh, tape, apparently. they. Uh, might be sponsored by Scotch Tape. Okay, all right, now it's coming out. Now what is it, let's see, what do we get? It felt like liquid, but I think that's because of all this that was wrapped around it. Oh yeah, this is a little, we're just gonna throw that on the floor. This is a Johnny Tattoo book. Uh, the introduction's by David Bolt. There's 3,000 designs in here and uh, they're pretty cool designs. They, uh, they're kind of dated, but you know, as with anything else, uh, dated designs, you can update them. You know, put, uh, put some new spin on it. Frankly, we've been doing that for decades. Continue doing it. So I'll show you better pictures of this. Here we go. Okay, now that we've seen better pictures of that, that package was bare, let me tell you. This package will not be such a bear. I can see, uh, oh, I can see how we're gonna, we don't even need the pink scissors for this one, ladies and gentlemen. So, this one is, I got a great story behind this one. Um, if it's what I think it is, yes. So, this came from the Tattoo Archive back in the day. Uh, I believe this is the, the description and stuff. Now this is the receipt. This is a really nice receipt though. So anyway, without further ado, this is from the WB Fox collection. It is uh, another uh, of, the, uh, of the tattooed women. When I saw this online, it had a little, uh, what looked like a piece of paper over top of the, of the photograph but it looks like the actual photo, yeah, I'll take it out of this. Uh, the actual photo, because of obscenity laws, the actual photo had to, uh, to blank out the belly whiskers, as, uh, as Coble was fond of saying. Um, if they hadn't have done this, like it was, it was fine to show bare-breasted women back in the day, back in the 30s and 40s, but it was not okay to show any kind of genitalia back then. That, it was considered uh, pornographic, and back then, pornography was illegal. So if you got caught with this, and it wasn't edited like this one is, uh, you'd have been thrown in jail uh, by the feds at that point. So, great picture. Now, this is Jean Fernall Carroll. 
and uh, she she was a bearded lady in the circus, and then she fell in love with a with a, uh, a barker, and the barker said he would never marry her while she had a beard. He just he couldn't bring himself to do it, so she got heavily tattooed by Charles Wagner, and then became a heavily tattooed attraction rather than the bearded lady shaved her beard off and always said that her beard was one of the only ones in the circus that was an actual real beard. So we got her picture now. I am gonna do a collection of her and uh, Jeanette Love and uh, Captain Don Leslie. We're gonna, we're gonna put all the circus attractions together in one big nice frame with the ticket. You'll see, you'll see. It's gonna be great, it's gonna be great. So. I got this in the mail this week, and uh, it, it came with a real nice letter that I'm not going to read to you right now because it is kind of a long letter, but um, we're going to start doing a new segment called, um, you know what, I'm not sure what it's going to be called yet. You all let me know what it's going to be called. What we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to do segments about un unsung heroes in this industry. There's a ton of artists that worked their entire lives that you've never heard the name of. This is one of them, uh, Mr. Domo from uh, Jackson, Tennessee. And uh, he sent me some really great, you know, last week I asked people to send me stuff through the mail. And uh, Mr. Domo did. He said, I've got a story for you that's never been told, that I would love told. And, you know, with the, the history coming out these days, everybody's wanting to know the history of this now. And had we been keeping it from the beginning, we'd have it all, but we didn't. We lost a bunch of these guys. And Mr. Domo's father, this is a generational tattoo artist. Um, he sent me some of his cards from the Ancient Art Studio uh, and the uh, down in, it uh, doesn't say where, buddy. Oh, Humboldt, Tennessee. So he sent me these, uh, these awesome cards from Humboldt, Tennessee. Sent me enough of them to give each of my guys one and uh, uh, one for my collection and then maybe a couple. Or a giveaway later. Stay tuned for that. But uh, he sent me these awesome articles um, from the newspaper, uh, from his uh, his father and his uncle. His father opened the first. Uh, uh, from what I gather so far, you'll you'll learn more about this because I'm gonna do an entire episode on this guy. Uh, his father opened the first tattoo uh, place in Jackson, Tennessee. His uh, uncle. Uh, Lou Spot was one of the first ones to open in St. Louis. So we're, we're definitely going to start shining a spotlight on some of these guys who, some of them worked their whole lives, some of them, it, it was generational. So the, the dad did some, the son did some, the grandson is in it now. Uh, it's like the Shaws, they are they're generational tattoo artists. So we're going to start shedding some light on some of those guys because I think they deserve it. Uh, and they, they haven't been given their due yet, so we're going to start giving them their due here. Okay, so, with mail being done, and um, I'm surprised the soapbox warning didn't go off there. So, uh, without any further ado, here is C.W. Eldridge and his fantastic presentation on Paul Rogers. Uh, check this out, I think you're gonna dig it. There's spaces and everybody seems to be having a good time. So, the Paul Rogers Research Center was built around Paul's collection. It was actually, the, the whole idea of the Research Center was to safeguard Paul's collection. Um, as in many tattooers, um, the, the collections kind of get lost, get scattered, and such as this. So um, in 93, we formed a nonprofit to safeguard his collection. And it's been a success. We've done a series of books cataloging uh, what Paul left when he left in his collection when he died. Um, and some of those are available through the Tattoo Archive. Here we see Paul when he was tattooing in Norfolk, Virginia. This is actually Paul on Coleman's boat. Coleman was a, a sailor, and um, not a U.S. Navy sailor, but he was a sailor nevertheless. And he lived in Norfolk, right off the Elizabeth River. And he had this boat that Paul would go out on with his friends. Uh, on the right here is a business card from um, the days that uh, Paul was working in the sideshow. Uh, you can see the Paul's writing on this uh, from the, the J.J. Page show, 1932. Uh, Paul spent almost seven years working in circuses and carnivals. 
Um, that would be a more of a spring, summer, fall kind of routine. And then he would come back to North Carolina or South Carolina and work in the cotton mills through the winter and then be back on the road again when spring would roll around. In 1945, he was approached by, probably 1944, he was actually approached by Coleman, um, a legendary tattooer from Norfolk, Virginia, to come and tattoo with Coleman in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, Coleman had seen some of Paul's work and actually mistaken it as his own tattooing. And uh, the sailor whose arm was, the tattoo was on, corrected Coleman, and it wasn't very long ago before Coleman went and got in contact with Paul and offered him a job after the war. Paul spent five years with Coleman from 45 to 1950. Um, and at, in 1950, the city of Norfolk outlawed tattooing. Or actually, they didn't outlaw tattooing. They actually quit issuing health permits. So you couldn't tattoo legally in the city without a health permit. So it was their way to move the tattooers out. Um, most of the tattooing in Norfolk at this time was on East Main Street, which was a, kind of an old street with a lot of really old buildings, and so the city had plans to redevelop, um, and so these buildings were all torn down. This photograph of, is of Coleman's shop front, and you can see here, Coleman spent most of his career working alone, mainly because he had such high standards that Nobody could kind of meet the standards. He would bring people in and they would do a, you know, a work, work a week with him and, and they wouldn't cut the mustard so they would move on. And so Coleman spent most of his career working alone, but you can see that he's got a sign here on the windows, three good tattooers. So Paul was there with him and then R.L. Connolly from Pith, uh, Petersburg, Virginia came along and he, Coleman hired him. So Coleman was so thrilled about having more tattooers that he painted his windows up. Um, so he, Coleman was at this location for, for many years, although he did move up and down East Main Street in probably four or five different locations. Now, during this era, tattooers would often move around on their street just looking for cheaper rent. Um, their shops were pretty spartan. So if they got a, a storefront down the street or across the street for 20 or $30 less a month, they would just move their shop and so they would minimize their overhead. Um, with this presentation here, or this slide here, um, you can see that the, um, Coleman teamed up with Jensen and had a supply business. And I think this was more Jensen's business than it was Coleman's, but they were working together at the time, and so um, Jensen was smart enough to put Coleman's name <laughs> in the front of his uh, advertising. And this is uh, the 427 Main Street that you see here is this location. Jensen, of course, was a supplier that's mainly uh, known for his years on the West Coast. Um, he was in, uh, worked at, in San Diego, and then he was in Los Angeles, and then he was at the Pike in Long Beach um, at the end of his career. In 1956 was one of the first, it's kind of hard-pressed to call it a convention, but it was more like a social gathering. Um, Les Skews, it's seen in the center here, with Paul Rogers on the left and Hux Folding on the right. Um, Skews in Bristol, England had um, established a, the Bristol Tattoo Club and got a lot of press uh, in English papers and then it was picked up by the AP here in the States and it ended up uh, news articles about Les Skews' club and American tattooers thought, oh, that sounds like a great idea. So they they started forming other clubs. And you know, in the 50s and 60s, there was probably at least a half dozen, maybe even a dozen tattoo clubs in North America. And this photo is from 1956, when Les Skews came from Bristol, England, to um, Sandusky, Ohio, and they had a, a meeting tattooers. Um, 
And there was probably maybe a half dozen or more tattooers that came and, and spent the weekend with Les there. And there was a lot of great black and white photographs, and a lot of them got souvenir tattoos. Um, and in the intervening years, um, Al Shackley, who had a tattoo club, and Milton Zeiss, who also had a tattoo club in the States, actually went to Bristol, England, and met with the Bristol Tattoo Club. So there was kind of an interchange between those clubs uh, that, in, in a way, kind of transformed English tattooing. Um, they kind of discovered the Coleman School of Tattooing, and um, the English tattooers really embraced that look. This is a post photograph of Paul uh, on, the, on the sideshow, working the sideshow, tattooing, would be tattooing his wife, Helen. Helen actually had no tattoos. She, um, her and Paul met. Uh, Helen was working in her stepfather's sideshow, uh, John T. Ray, the Happy Land shows. You can see the little uh, ad for it here on the, on the right. Uh, and, um, Helen worked as a Hawaiian dancer, she worked as a, a snake handler, and so she says that Paul was hired as a tattoo artist and an acrobat. Um, they fell in love, got married, and then spent those seven years uh, working the shows together. This is a great uh, photograph of Paul's uh, setup of the splash and stuff. You can see that uh, they were, a lot of these lots were just dirt, and if the rains came, they just turned to mud. So you can see they put down a piece of plywood so that the chairs and the, the tattooer and the customer could actually be up out of the mud. Classic setup. In the 1950s, after Norfolk closed, Rogers and Conley opened two shops. They opened one in, in Jacksonville, North Carolina, and they opened one in Connolly's hometown of Petersburg, Virginia. And they would rotate between those two shops. Um, and business kind of fell off a little bit in the later 50s, and they ended up splitting the shops. Uh, Connolly took the Petersburg shop, and Paul uh, had the Jacksonville shop, which was in a less than ideal location. He decided to close that shop, and he went to, to meet and talk to Huck Spaulding, who had just come to town with, he had sold his animal show, which is a carnival show, and uh, Spaulding was, had been tattooing as a hobby, and so he decided to pursue tattooing more seriously, so he got this location on Court Street in Jacksonville, North Carolina, and when Paul went to kind of talk to him and tell him that you know he was closing and that the business, the location they were at wasn't very good. Huck offered him a job. And so that was the formation of Spalding and Rogers. Uh, this was around uh, 1955, 1956. And you can see they had a spectacular shop front here in Court Street. Uh, they were so, this street was so famous for tattooing that they didn't even put a number on the card. They would just direct people to the street. It's almost like what Coleman would do. Um, he had a business card that um, had no address on it, not even a street address. It simply said, when in Norfolk, see Coleman. Uh, and you can see that uh, Paul is kind of uh, working on uh, the, kind of running a little bit on, on Coleman's coattails here, um, advertising his tattooing as Coleman style. Coleman, of course, was a legend on the East Coast. He was, um, his tattooing was very popular. His style, and actually his style of tattooing is still popular, and people are still trying to figure out how to make that stuff look like Coleman did. Paul Rogers was a, a, a great tattooer, uh, but today he's actually better known, perhaps, as a machine builder. Um, he was in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, Paul's career is a little bit confusing because he worked in three different towns named Jacksonville. He was in Jacksonville, North Carolina. He was in Jacksonville, Florida. And here he is located in Jacksonville Beach, 
for it. Um, and he, there was a bunch of thugs that came into the shop in Jacksonville, Florida, and beat Paul up. And then after that, he, would, he became fearful of working in a street shop by himself. So he kind of semi-retired uh, to his trailer, which was in Jacksonville Beach, and he started building machines. And he had a little tiny workshop, about 12 by 12 feet. Um, the only power tools he had was a, a drill and um, a grinder. And he built these uh, fabulous machines. He took all those years of experience that he had gained working with the likes of Coleman um, and put them into these machines and they became um, a very sought out item in the tattoo world. Um, and I think the most expensive machine that I ever saw Paul sell was maybe around $300. Um, we have some here, some vintage ball machines, that are going for like $5,000. So you can give you an idea of um, the kind of the lineage that came with these machines and the history behind them. Uh, and what a great tool they are. The illustration that you see here is done by a fellow named Camp Cook, uh, who uh, is better known as a West Coast tattooer. He did this illustration for the archive. And this, book, this business card actually was designed by Mike, uh, Mike Malone for, for Paul, uh, promoting his machines. This is Paul in his little work shed, uh, which he affectionately called the Iron Factory. Uh, and you can see that he <laughs> perhaps wasn't the most organized uh, machinist builder that you've ever seen, but uh, his machines were excellent. Uh, people from all over the world come to visit him and would sit uh, out in the building. But the little building was so small that actually you had a high chair or a chair or a stool that you sat outside the door of the workshop while Paul did his work inside the shop. There was barely room for two people in the shop. Uh, but uh, he built machines here for many years, um, sold them around the world. Um, so, uh, I knew one collector that had 50 of his tattoo machines at one time. And you can see one of his um, prefab machines here on the top. Uh, he, he never really had a signature machine. Um, he never had a six. He had some machines cast, some frames cast that he was never satisfied with once they were cast. So he would basically take sheet steel and um, iron bars and cut them down and mold them into these shapes and then bolt, bolt the side plate and the, the coil mount and the back spring mount all together and hand wrap the coil cores and um, make these machines. He, when he worked by himself, he would make one machine a day. That was pretty much his, his goal. Um, and he would they were, they were never anything fancy. Uh, I think the, the spark of tape on the coils was about as fancy as Paul's machines ever got. He would, uh, the, once the frame was built, he would kind of file them down and clean them up and then paint them with a spray can. So they were, <laughs> they were very homespun, but um, uh, an amazing tool. And the interesting thing about Paul is that he was from the era of where if there was two tattooers working on the shop, generally one would do the outlining and then one would do the shading. And the, the reason being for this is that it would cut the competition out between the tattooers. They would both get a piece of the action. Uh, and so it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be Paul's customer, or it wouldn't be Huck's customer, it would be their customer. And so Paul had perfected Shady. So he was the shader in all these setups. Huck would do the, the outlining, uh, Paul would do the shading. So Paul always felt that his shading machines were superior to his outlining machines just because he had so much more experience doing that. Here's Paul standing in the doorway of the Iron Factory holding one of, uh, one of his sons. 
And this, this sign here is uh, from Paul's early career. This was a shop sign that he would put inside the shop. That sign was painted by, uh, I think, Tom Beasley, the original one. Yes. These are some of the, the booklets that we produced of showing Paul's collection. Um, all this stuff has been um, assessed into the nonprofit, so um, it can it can never be sold. It can never kind of leave that nonprofit. And uh, we would take about 50 items a year and create a little catalog of those items. Uh, we give the weight and the measurements, and you know, much like you would have uh, an art catalog. And we have uh, about, uh, I don't know, 25 years of these. And it gives you a nice cross-section of what Paul left when he died. Thank you very much for your time. If anybody has any questions. And uh, I'll talk with the hour. Yeah? He was not a big man. He was maybe five, six, or five, seven, or something. <laughs> he, was even, he was even shorter, yes. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so, wow, right? Um, we, we felt lucky to be there, and next year, definitely start making your plans now. Winston-Salem 2020, uh, we're going to be there, so you should be there too. So until next time, everybody be careful and keep collecting. <laughs>